Hello, I'm Rachel Bleemer. I'm Director of Programming and Events for Film Independent. Before we get started today, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, the Global Globe Foundation, and our friends at Amazon to, uh, and MGM for making this Q&A possible. Um, I'm so excited to speak with Director and Editor Carla Gutierrez. Hello, Carla. Hey. Um, Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, first off, I just wanna congratulate you on creating such a beautiful and inspiring piece of art with Frida. Um, I have so many questions, but I'd like to get started with the origin of this project. Um, knowing your background in editing, how did you come to decide like Frida was gonna be your directorial debut? Um, I think the, the film, the story itself told me so. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, just going back to to the story of Frida, because I've been living with her story for a few decades. I was one of those people that, you know, has been obsessed with Frida and like has learned everything about Frida. But I never really thought of, you know, a potential film with her until I went back to, you know, to the idea of a story. And I saw that she could carry a lot of her her own life story with her own words. And I just had never seen a documentary that truly focused on her voice. Um, they're wonderful documentaries, but you know, they had seen her through the distance of history, you know, contemporary experts talking to us about, about her. And I just thought that we had an opportunity here for to let her speak and, and tell us how she felt about you know, moments in her life and, and really make the connection between her life and her paintings. Um, so it was really the story that chose me. I didn't think I was going to direct. I didn't, had no desires of directing. <laughs> I got in the directing bag since then, yeah. but, but it was really, you know, Frida herself, I think said, you know, you've done this as an editor, so you better jump on this. And, and we started. That's so, so cool. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, can you talk about how you obtained all this material, like what that experience was like? There are things in this documentary that audiences have never seen or heard before. Um, it, it's just, it's so inspiring. How did you go about obtaining this source material? So um, the first thing we did was to, obviously at the, at the very beginning, we needed to know if we could get access to her words. And um, the, the beauty of it is that both Diego and, and Frida were, you know, big communists and they be believe in art for the people, to inform the people of the people. And so when Frida Kahlo died, Diego actually gave the trust of both his, his art and her art and also their writings to the people of Mexico. So, so when you license that material, you're actually asking for, for permission from the government of Mexico to do so, um, which is really nice because it's not like you're trying to get exclusivity from, from a state. So, so there are you know, wonderful projects about Frida that can be done because mm -hmm. the of Mexico own, owns her, which I think she would have loved. Um, and then, and then it was, you know, I had an amazing production team led by producer Katya Maguire, who did just like, you know, intensive research. Again, we, we did not want to interview um, any, you know, have any contemporary interviews uh, right. with experts. And we did not actually want to shoot any contemporary footage of Mexico. We wanted to take viewers to that world that she lived in um, and, and create this immersive, but also that, that it feels present, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this immersive experience into her world and her mind. And they just, you know, so that was her shooting. It was like our archival producer was like my DP, you know, he went everywhere yeah. looking for like image, like new images of Mexico, uh, mm -hmm. whatever footage of Mexico where you would feel like Frida is looking at, at that at that world and interacting with it mm -hmm. and then all the all the photographs of, of Frida and some of the film of Frida that we found so it was like a really involved research archival you know task that we we went into how long did that all take from beginning to end 
I'm not completely sure. <laughs> it's a, a blur. <laughs> it's a blur. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know that. Um, I know that the from the moment we started production to the mm -hmm. moment we finished the film, it was a full year and a half. Um, so we dove right into research and archival uh, gathering, and then. Um, um, but I'm, I, I really don't remember. It, it would have been like at least a few months where mm -hmm. we had all the writing um, and we kept collecting archival footage and photos, you know, throughout the entire editing process. Yeah, there's so, so much to work with. Um, being an editor yourself, was there a lot, uh, was it difficult to cut your own work, first of all? And also, you know, was there a lot of footage and things that that got left on the cutting room floor? Um, so I, you know, I I know um, so well how documentaries come together mm -hmm. from my experience in editing. And they really, to me, they come together in the conversations that happen in the edit room. I mean, there's so much beautiful work that happens in the, in the the on the field, mm -hmm. but, you know, documentaries are all also written in the edit room. And it's that conversation that I've been able to have with directors, for example, like, prompting of questions. What is this scene really about? What is the theme of the film, right? So I knew that I did not want to lose that delicate, creative, beautiful process of writing the film mm -hmm. um, because it was just me. Like I was going to have a monologue with myself and the material <laughs> in front of me. Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, so just putting that, that, that I knew that as a director, the first thing that I needed to do was to put the right team together that could support the process of me having those two hats on, the director yeah. and the edit. And, you know, one of the best decisions I made was to ask David Teague to come on board as our supervising editor. And I'm sure, you know, the audience is really familiar with, with his work. He's been involved in so, so many, like, incredible documentaries, American documentaries in the past 20 years um and and that's what we did you know it's just like this wonderful conversations where you know it, we both asked a lot of questions and and just kind of like you know challenge and and supported each other in like finding the focus of the themes in our in our film and and it's just like a beautiful a beautiful process of feeling supported and and you know a collaborative process Thank you. Yeah, that's a beautiful answer. I, I know it's uh, it's delicate. You know, you want to do Frida justice with all this, and I appreciate that you kept it in Spanish. And um, even excuse with, me. Oh, sorry. That's you. <laughs> even with the um, this this you know the animations that you did with her art, it wasn't you didn't add to her art. You just made it come alive in a different way that we've never been able to see before. So it was so appreciated and, and beautiful. Um, you know, I was able to experience it on a big screen and a small screen and both I found different things. Um, and it just, it's just so beautiful. That's not a question. It's just me gushing. Um, <laughs> but uh, can you tell me about how you found uh, Fernanda, the voice of Frida? I mean, she was so perfect uh, from beginning to end. Um, and you know, was it someone you knew or did you just were like, that's it? Or was there a process to it? Because she just felt like felt like Frida was talking to us the whole time. We did have a casting, um, a, a casting director in Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. And because there were, you know, there were a few voices that we were casting for. Right. And, um, and we wanted to make sure that it was, you know, it was all Mexican talent. Um, and that and we were looking for, you know, just great performances. So our casting director, you know, did not only look at like the obvious places of people that are only doing film or television or like well-known talent in, you know, kind of like celebrity talent in Mexico. Uh, but we really dig deep into the stage, um, people with stage experience and, and in theater. And we just, you know, lots of wonderful character actors, um, in that world and and we were really looking for somebody of uh, the voice that we were seeking was um not necessarily like a very specific texture of voice but mm -hmm. we were looking for somebody that would could give us a performance and a depth of you know in the performance of somebody that was um 
mature woman that had lived a lot and mm -hmm. that had experienced grief and that had experienced loss and that had experienced pain, even physical pain, but also had never lost this passion and that this vibrancy of like holding on to life because that was that's who, who Frida was mm -hmm. and also even like the freshness of like child you know like the childhood curiosity that she had and and that's what Fernanda gave us from the very first audition um there were a couple of voices that we really liked mm -hmm. and we did you know actually place their voices from the audition against our, the image that we were editing. And Fernanda Chevarria's voice just kind of like really embodied. When we saw her against the, you know, the image of Frida um, from the pictures, it just like really embodied her spirit and the way that she was performing. Um, so yeah, that, that, that moment was very special. Funny thing is, I had to be Frida for most of the editing process. <laughs> and and um, you know, I did not completely suck, which was yeah. very helpful. Okay, okay. good, good. <laughs> it was helpful because we needed, you know, if not, like the right. film fell so flat, you know, as we were putting it together. So I, I gave it my all. <laughs> it's so great to change my voice to Fernanda. Yeah. Like that was a really happy day when I finally stopped having to edit my voice. <laughs> Yeah, I, I hope that if there's a, ever a DVD, we could have like special features of that version of you talking. <laughs> I mean, there were there were there were a couple of people in my team that were so used to it because that right. that's what we had her for eight months. Yeah, wow. They're like, oh, I miss it, and I was yeah. like, I do not miss the Peruvian accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really bad performance. Yeah, they they got over it. Really fast. Like, yeah, once they heard Fernando. Oh. You know, Okay. <laughs> um, were you able to speak with, I know, because it's not the typical interviews, like we're saying, um, with documentaries, but were you able to talk to any of her living relatives or friends through this process at all? Yeah, we actually did a lot of research. We also talked to, to a lot of academics. Um, and the people that we didn't get to talk to, uh, we actually read you know, my team read, I think, all the books that exist of Frida. Maybe we missed some that have not been translated to to English. Right. But um, what we follow every footnote to make sure that we were making sure that we had every single writing of Frida that is accessible. There are some collections that have not been published, that like there's no access to them of like some letters that she sent to a couple of lovers, unfortunately. Um, but um, but yeah, we also reached out to um, Frida's grannies, uh, Christina Kahlo, um, especially because we had seen that she was a photographer herself. There's a lot of photographers in that family Her because Frida's father was a photographer. Yeah. yeah. And Christina and her brother, Billy Kahlo, they're both photographers, very different photographers, but it's really interesting to see kind of like, you know, the creativity that continues in that family. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Christina had um, gone to get uh, Frida's um, hospital records from the hospital where she spent most of her surgeries and her time, especially during the end of her life. And and she had helped, um, you know, museums, um, you know, like around the world to do exhibitions that focused on, on Frida's physical state um, and, you know, and her disabilities and her surgeries and like Frida's body. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it was really interesting to both take her take on, you know, kind of like the family mythology because the family itself, like, you know, you hear the stories from the family and it's not only what you're reading in the books. Um her own understanding of Frida, but also this like, you know, knowledge that she had of all the medical records. And also she's done a lot of work in terms of like reviewing photos um, for Casa Azul. And so, yeah. And her father was a photographer, Frida's um, nephew. And he took some photographs that we use. I think a couple of photographs that we use in the film when he was, when he was pretty young, when he was a wow. boy still. Yeah. She's so 
well documented and like you said having her father have those portraits of her when she's a little girl it's just it's some of my you could see her personality just radiate through those portraits when she's so tiny and um it's it's so rare to have a subject that you have captured from the beginning of their life up until the very end in so many different mediums and you did it in such um beautiful justice so Thank you. Um, yeah I, I have this I mean we didn't we did not want to be kind of explicit um you know and and showing like the exposition of like her artistic influences but I hope we hope that we that they were very present so people could right. actually feel them so you know the catholic world like catholic imagery really went into her painting but also you know you can see the self portraits how they come very much from that that experience that she had of being her photo taken from really early on like she mm -hmm. knew how to work the camera and you can see through you know like it was her father first but then mm -hmm. photographers just were so into taking her picture not only because of like how striking she looked but mm -hmm. also because of like the how she posed in front oh, of the camera. yeah and she knew how to do that from from really mm -hmm. really you know really young and Nobody did in Mexico, you know, mm -hmm. only the the people whose fathers, you know, were. Yeah. So. yeah. And then you see, you see the self portraits there. She is posing for a photograph. It's the same, oh, yeah, the same yeah. kind of like, you know, gaze out and even like the, you know, position of her body. So she knew. So, yeah. <laughs> So it's, yeah, um, we hope, you know, I mean, again, we don't want to be um, explicit in an academic way about it in the film, but we hope that that at least people can feel that emotional connection of her influences for her paintings. Definitely. Um, so you, you've surrounded yourself with such inspiring women in your work with RBG and uh, Julie Child and I'm saying this right, Chava, Chavea, Chavea. Um, I mean, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, do you uh, want to continue to tell these these stories? Is this what you see, or is there something you're working on next that you want to share? Um, I do think that there is an um, very much an attraction to female badasses in my work. So I I think that you know organically I'm going to be attracted to that um, forever. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, early in my career, I, I edited a film about, you know, beauty queens in a Colombian prison and also uh, about, uh, you know, female bullfighters in Spain. So it's it's a it's theme. Great. Yeah, it's, it's a work. theme. It's <laughs> it's a theme. theme. I don't think I can, I can step away from it for too no, long. Please but do. Um, no, but I, I'm really attracted to, I mean, I, there's definitely an attraction to to Latinx stories, but I don't want to only do Latinx stories. Um, I think I'm just attracted to, you know, stories that that kind of reveal the complexities of human experience or even the complexity of like social conditions, but in intimate ways. Like I'm, I'm really interested to find stories that can be told really well. And sometimes you just have to, you have to know that like you can either capture that material with Verite or mm -hmm. there is material that can help you build a really interesting story that can be told in an, in an inter interesting way. So. Okay, well, we are all very excited to see uh, what you do next. I hope you have a break between because this the, the Frida storm is, is taken over. It's been um, so great to watch the, the buzz from Sundance and, um, everything up until now and I uh, it's really it comes out uh next Friday the March 14th for those watching um please see it tell your friends um celebrate this and um thank you Carla I am I'm just I'm, I'm kind of like geeking out because I just want to keep asking you so many questions but time is up and um thank you and please when you're in Los Angeles come visit Film Independent uh we're admirers of your work Thank, Thank you, you so much. I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to continue the conversation. I would love that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carla.